Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another Xamarin University guest lecture. My name is Rob Gimmins, and I'm very pleased to welcome you all to our fourth and last Xamarin University guest lecture in our September Back to School event. Today, Greg Shackles is going to take us on a deep dive through a range of techniques for testing our mobile apps. And Greg is a principal engineer at Olo, and he's a Xamarin MVP. He blogs, he runs the New York City mobile.net users group, he speaks about Xamarin at a ton of conferences like our own Xamarin Evolve. And I know I've personally learned so much from Greg. I hope you all do too. Now, as always, if you have questions during the, the webinar, please use the go to webinar control panel to ask questions there. I'll try to answer any questions that I can. And if it makes sense, I'll interrupt Greg and ask the question right then. Now, I might leave some of the questions until the end for Greg to answer though. So if your question isn't answered immediately, don't worry, we will get to it uh, at the end. And with that, it's all yours, Greg. All right. Thanks, Rob, and, and thanks to everyone for joining. I know depending on where you are, it might be a little early, so I, I appreciate everyone who's who's taken the time out to, to talk about testing, which is a, you know, a love of mine, as, as I've become sort of known for in the, the Xamarin circles. Um, so I have some slides. I want to try and get through those as quickly as we can because I do want to show a lot of code too. So often, often when I kind of start talks around this topic, I, I try and do a little bit of song and dance and storyline around this, but in the interest of, of just kind of, let's cut right to the chase for, for this session today and, and, and just talk about why, why all this stuff is really important. Um, and this is a slide that I really like to show as an example. I've been using it, uh, if you've seen any of my testing talks for a couple of years, this is kind of one of my go-tos. Um, but it really, it really highlights why testing and stability is really important in the, the app world. And, and a lot of it comes down to the distribution model. This was, this was an update that Amazon released a couple of years ago now, uh, I guess, yeah, in 2013, to their Kindle app. And what they found after this thing was released was that when you launched the app, it would it would delete any downloads that you had. So any movies, like any Kindle books, like everything that you had stored would be deleted from your app, and you'd have to re-download everything, which which is not good. And since you can't pull updates out of the store, the best that they could do is was put this little note in the release notes that updated in a in a faster time than that to say, hey, please don't install this uh, this update. You're probably going to hate us for it. Uh, and that's really not a good position to be in. Like the, the app distribution model, it, this isn't the, the web where you can kind of fix a bug and the next time the user reloads the page, that, that bug is gone and it's like it never happened. These are updates. Uh, this is a distribution model where you have to wait for, in the case of iOS, you have to wait for your app to be approved, which could take a week or so. Then even after that, you have to wait for the user to download, install that app, and start using the app again. And, and hopefully they haven't left by then. Um, and the other downside to this is when you when you annoy users in the app world, they have a very public means of, of letting you know about it. And and trust me, users are far more likely to leave you a, a negative review than a positive review. And these reviews stick with you for, from version to version. So just because you fixed a bug uh, doesn't mean that that review goes away from the, the previous version that's there. And, and just as a kind of a visual representation of how much more likely users are to leave you negative reviews than positive reviews. This is a graph from an app that, that I worked on. Um, the, in the interest of my own reputation, I do want to point out that the, the left side of this graph was before I took over this app, and then we released a set of updates um, once we took the app over, and users were a lot more positive. But you could see that the volume of reviews that were coming in, while the percentage-wise they were, they were a lot more positive than negative, the the overall volume really took a hit. And this was like once you really stopped annoying those users and, and aggravating them, they just stopped leaving reviews. So it you really want to go out of your way to, to make sure that you're delivering really nice experiences for your users and, and making things good for them. Because even outside of just not wanting to to have embarrassing reviews in the store and you know feeling bad about ourselves, there's also the fact that with so many options out in the store, there odds are there's at least a couple apps in the store that do something similar to what you're trying to do. 
um, users are just not that likely these days to keep trying an app that's failing. Um, if they are, then, then you're somewhat lucky, but, but most users are going to try an app, and if it fails for them a couple times, you're, just, you're kind of out of luck, and you, you might have lost them forever to one of your competitors or, or some other service or something. Um, but you really have a very, very brief window to make a good first impression for users. So s stability and quality really has to, to be a priority as you're developing these things. So if you kind of look at what we'll call like the, the classical quality model of, of developing software, a lot of, you know, usually in the early stages you would just kind of, you'd have a lot of, uh, spikes and you you would start like really just trying to scrape together an app, go as fast as you can, try to get to a proof of concept. And as you inch closer and closer to the, that release date, oh, you start to care about quality a little bit more. But by then, you might have already accumulated so much tech debt and, and so many bad mistakes or shortcuts or swept some things under the rug that it gets a lot harder to, to shoehorn quality in at the end. So uh, the approach that, that I want to kind of talk about today is an approach of shifting that attention towards quality much closer to the beginning of a project and do, being able to do so in a way that doesn't necessarily hold you back. So this, you know, there's a lot of testing talks out there where someone will get kind of up on their soapbox, um, not that I don't get up on my soapbox, and and they, they try to, to basically say, well, you need X percent code coverage or you need to do this or you need to do that. Um, kind of the approach that I want to talk about today, it uses a lot of those same practices, but, but really the goal should be writing tests around the things that provide value to you um, if, and testing things that will kind of help you down the line. And in my experience, using smart approaches to testing has led to both, um, for one, just a good safety net of test coverage and high test coverage, but also just an ability to actually move a lot faster if you're architecting your things correctly. Um, and a lot of times it can mean that you're testing functionality without having to spin up an emulator or a simulator or devices, tap eight screens deep into your app, notice that there's a problem, and then repeat that over and over and over again. So in a lot of cases, it can actually speed up development rather than hinder it. So there's a, there's a bunch of approaches that you can take to testing, um, and these are all valid approaches. This isn't a, a, a mutually exclusive kind of situation. So the, the, the one classic one is just standard beta testing, right? You, you build your app, you release it out to, to a set of beta, use, beta users who've opted into to testing for you. Um, the downside is that the, the release cycle here and the, the iteration cycle becomes a lot slower because there's, there's, for one, just a lot more overhead in getting these builds out, and then you have to wait for re, um, reports to come back in and iterate on top of that. But the benefit is that you get highly authentic user tests, so your users are probably testing different paths than you even thought about because you built the app. You're only you're you might only be thinking about the happy path, but users tend to do weird, wacky things when they get uh, the app in their hands. Um, so, kind of a step in from that is just doing your own manual testing, which has slightly better iteration cycles than beta testing, since you're kind of doing it yourself, um, or maybe in your QA department, but the authenticity goes down a little bit because you, you might not be thinking again about those, those non-happy path situations quite as much. Then on the far opposite side of this graph you have unit testing where its big, big advantage is rapid iteration, right? Like these are tests that you can run on every build, every check-in, um, over and over locally and we'll talk, I'll show later an example of just how easy it is to run tests over and over. Um, but unit, the idea behind unit tests is they test one small thing, they test it well, and they test it quickly. So you can run hundreds of these very, very quickly. Um, so the, the iteration cycle becomes very, very fast. You can iterate very fast. Uh, but your tests, by design, end up being a lot more simplistic. So you're probably not testing a whole lot of pieces at once. You're testing pieces in isolation. And then finally, you can automate some of the UI testing. So this ends up being pretty similar to manual testing in the complexity of what you're going to be testing, um, but at least you can test the interface itself and you can make sure that, okay, when all of these pieces are put together, the app is actually functioning from the perspective that the user would be seeing it uh, in a correct manner. 
and you can start at least smoke testing out the basic flows through your app and not have to spend your manual testing cycles on the same thing over and over and over. Because if you have manual testing cycles, you really want people to be able to spend their time being creative, trying to think outside of the box a little bit, trying to screw things up, and then rely on your, your standard automated testing to, to smoke out the basic scenarios and not, not waste human time there. And then I mentioned unit testing, and, and this is kind of a, a snapshot of um, the platform that I run at, at Olo, the company I work at, where we built out um, what we call App Core, which is really just the shared code base for, for our app platform that has things like view model services, uh, network access, database access, basically all of the, the screen logic, everything that's not the UI. We built this out very deliberately in a, in a test-driven way and in a testable way, I should, is, is a more accurate way to put it. Um, and we were able to write all of, take all of these tests that we wrote, which is in the, around 650 at this snapshot here a few days ago. And not only can we run those tests in, in our Team City build on every check-in and every branch, but we can take those exact same tests and run them on iOS and run them on Android because really those are the platforms that matter. It, it wouldn't ultimately matter that much if this didn't run on a standard.net platform. It really only matters that when you get it onto a device, onto iOS and Android, that these tests run. Um, so one of the other things that we'll, I'll show an example of later in the code area is, is how you can really easily take your tests, run them on these platforms, and verify that, yes, your code works as expected on the platforms that truly matter. And then taking that a bit further to talk about the UI testing piece, Xamarin has a library called Xamarin.UITest that's written on top of uh, an underlying framework called Calabash that allows you to write your UI tests in C Sharp or F Sharp, and it lets you write them really, really easily and concisely, which is awesome. You can use you can take these same exact tests, and if you write them correctly, uh, and again, we'll we'll talk about this in some code details later. But if you write your tests carefully and correctly, you can run the exact same tests on iOS and Android without having to modify anything. Um, so this gets really, really powerful. You don't have to write all your UI tests twice necessarily. You can just write one set of tests, run the scenarios on both platforms, and be confident that your UIs are working across the board. Um, you can take these and run them in simulators. You can run them on devices. Really anywhere that your app runs is, is going to be fair game there. Um, and, and taking that a step further, too, the, this Xamarin UI test, is a, it's compatible with all apps that you might have. So even if you wrote your app in Objective-C or Swift or Java, uh, it's going to be fully compatible with that. If you have a hybrid app, so you're, you have some sort of web view kind of situation in your app, you can still take advantage of UI test. Uh, and, of course, if you're using Xamarin, which is really a native app uh, under the hood, just the same as Objective-C, Swift, or Java, uh, you can run the tests against your app as well. So really, this is just a generic testing framework that, that lets you write your UI tests very, very nicely. So, so we have the, the basic tests, um, testing approaches kind of outlined there. But, you know, just to, to have some real talk here for a second, there's a lot of devices out there. And you don't really want to have to have all of these in-house all the time because... Well, if you have a budget that big, then then maybe maybe we should talk because that that's that sounds like a pretty nice situation to have. Um, even in the iOS world, in the last few years, we've had an ever-growing variety of devices and sizes. So everything from the 4S up to the size of the 6 and the 6 Plus. Now the the iPad has a few sizes. There's the Pro coming out soon. So it's not quite what Android is, but even on the iOS side, there's a really growing number of devices and sizes and things that you need to think about in order to make sure that your app scales and, and functions properly across all these devices. And then on top of that, you you have you sprinkle in your, your varying versions of iOS and that kind of thing. On Android, it's a, it's a lot more colorful. Um, so this is, is, this is kind of like a really cool look and a really scary look all at once from a company called OpenSignal that published this report a couple months back. Um, but this is kind of a snapshot of what you know the, some of the most popular devices are and what the fragmentation is like across the Android ecosystem. And this is where it really starts to get into the area of you don't want to have to have all of these devices on hand 
And even if you did, you wouldn't want to have to test all of your apps and all of your scenarios across all of them because that's going to take forever. And it just gets really, really out of hand. Uh, to use another example of uh, an app, this is take a screenshot that I took from Google Play of an app that I manage. Um, and if I, I took the screenshot a couple days ago, if I went back, that number of devices probably has already grown just because there's always more and more being added. So, and I'm not even really targeting crazy old versions of Android with this one. So it's really just um, Jelly Bean and up, so Android API level 14 and up. And even that Google Play advertises as being over 7,500 supported devices out there. Or sorry, ice cream sandwich and up. Um, so that's a lot of devices. And granted, some of those are going to have very small market share. If you look back at the, that, last, um, that last overview, for example, but that's still a lot of devices that, that people can have and a lot of different versions of Android. And um, a lot of times the manufacturers make their own little updates to, to Android. So that's a huge, huge variety of things out there that you need to be thinking about when it comes to Android development. And that's where Xamarin's Test Cloud becomes a really, really nice tool to take advantage of, to, to offload some of that device management and, and thinking uh, off to their cloud. So basically what you can do is you can take those exact same UI tests that we talked about a few slides ago using Xamarin UI test, and you could just point them at Test Cloud and say, I want to run those tests on these 30 devices, these 50 devices. Like they have thousands of devices in their device lab, and you can just take these tests and target them. Um, and we'll, I'll show a little more in-depth example of that, that later, but you can see that you could really quickly see what your app looks like on these different devices. You could see whether you have a, a weird crash or weird layout issue on Samsung versus Sony. Uh, it really, really lets you take advantage of um, just seeing what your app does on all these platforms. Like I know at work we were, we were doing a big redesign lately of something and Test Cloud really helped us uh, smoke out some some weird layout issues that we probably wouldn't have found until it hit the app stores otherwise. So it's, it's a great tool to take advantage of. And I know for any university students, you you all have some free hours that Xamarin gives you. So I, if you haven't already, I highly encourage going and checking it out and taking, taking advantage, playing around, and, and seeing what's in there. So that's the the automated testing side of this, but I, I don't want to undercut the importance of actual user testing. Um, because when it really comes down to it, users aren't going to care that your unit tests pass. Like, you can't respond to a bad review in the App Store and say, well, my build was green, my tests were green, so you're wrong. Like, really, it's, it's the user's experience that ultimately matters here. So user testing is super, super important. And there's a few, there's a bunch of ways out there to do it. There's a bunch of companies that are introducing alternatives in their own ways. So I, I just want to, this isn't meant to be a comprehensive list, but I want to mention a few few options that I've used. Um, so one is TestFlight, who Apple bought a couple years back and really internalized. So built into iTunes Connect is this whole TestFlight subsystem that allows you to, to create internal builds and external builds um, and send your send builds of your app out to users without having to do the necessarily do the old dance of adding their device to your developer account and creating new provisioning profiles and, and that whole nightmare. Um, so they give you a pretty nice system now for, for doing this distribution without ha and being able to skip all of those steps. Um, it's an Apple tool, so it's iOS only, but it's, it's a very good option if you're looking to test your and distribute your iOS apps to beta testers. Um, similarly, on the, the Google Play side, they have an, obviously an Android-only version. Um, you could do alpha beta releases within Google Play of your apps um, and also do what, what are called staged rollouts, which could be useful. So you can, once you determine that you want to release an app out to the store, you could start doing it in staged rollouts so that you can maybe pull it back if, if you start to see errors coming in from users that upgrade or something. So, so maybe you still aggravate some set of users, but you haven't impacted your whole user base. So that can be a really, really useful tool. And then another tool that, that's worth mentioning um, that, that I actually take advantage of a lot is, is Hockey App, which is similar to what 
test flight used to be. Uh, it supports iOS and Android and basically just gives you full control over distribution and it has some crash reporting and analytics tools and stuff like that built in if you want to take advantage. Um, but really it just gives you your own distribution channel to, to do kind of whatever you want. It has APIs for accessing it. Um, so, so what we actually have at work is the ability to do a one-click deploy uh, of any app from any branch out to Hockey app uh, from our Team City environment, so we don't have to do anything manually there. Uh, so it can be a really good tool to, to check out if you're looking for something that's for one cross-platform, so you can use it on both these platforms. Uh, I believe they have Windows Phone support as well, but I might be wrong about that. Um, but they're, they're also owned by Microsoft now, so that's probably right. And then the the last thing that I want to mention here on this is so, a s slight tangent from testing, but I, I kind of view this as all part of the same story, and, and that's the your responsibility for testing and monitoring your app doesn't stop at the the release point. So when it hits stores and goes to users, you shouldn't be waiting for users to complain or leave you bad reviews to know that something's going wrong in your app. So monitoring and reporting and analytics and all this stuff gets super, super important um, for the reasons that I mentioned earlier. Like you only have this this very small window to to capture users' loyalty, and and you don't want that to be spoiled by uh, a bad experience. So this really comes down to being proactive and not reactive. Most users won't actually report problems too, so they'll probably just uninstall your app and not say a thing. The ones that do, as as I showed earlier, and they're far more likely to do this than leave a good review, is is kind of just mar your reputation publicly with with a bad review, which which is not good for anyone. What you really want is you want to be notified as something happens and to whom it happens, because context is super super important. So this this applies to crash reports, um, errors. So you should be logging errors too. Hopefully you're not crashing and you're you're actively catching any errors that are going on and reporting those back to your your logging service so that you still know about them without having to have the app poof away on the the user. Um, and you should have analytics in place so you know who's what users are in your app and what features they're using because. Just because you think a feature is really cool or really useful doesn't mean that anyone's using it. So you should really know what's going on in your app. And the, the to whom part really matters a lot here as well because um, if you see that there's that someone hit a crash and you know who that user is, you might be able to, to get their loyalty back just by reaching out to them before they have a chance to even complain or, or really get riled up and say, hey, we saw that you had a problem in our app, we're looking into it, and, and you can deal with them on a more personal level, and, and that's a way to really, once you have that sort of interaction with a user, the, the chances are much higher of, of them having a good opinion of you, even though they had a negative experience. Uh, so it's a really, really powerful tool for you know achieving user loyalty and uh, getting people to, to stick around, even if something does go wrong. And there's a lot of tools out there for for monitoring. Um, I'm, I don't want to dig into to all this stuff, but I did want to call out a few that that I use that um, I'm big fans of. Obviously, Xamarin has their their own insights platform uh, that does crash reporting, error reporting, analytics. It's really really nice. Uh, Raygun is one that I use a lot on not just mobile apps, but desktop and uh, desktop apps, web apps, Windows services, basically everything. Uh, so it's another really nice error reporting tool. Uh, Google Analytics is, is a great, great and free tool for doing uh, in-app analytics. Um, you should be, you can take advantage if you're using tools like HipChat or Slack. You could have, basically, they all have, a, everything in the world now has APIs, so you could start tying all of your tools together and making it so that when something happens that you need to know about, the your tools push these things out to you instead of you having to go to a thousand different dashboards and kind of ask disparate services, what's going on. You can have everything sort of come to you through HipChat or, or Slack or, or a, a pager on-call service like PagerDuty that we use at Olo, which is really, really great. Um, but really the takeaway here is that you should have all of your tools really working for you and, and pushing the information to you that you need. And that's all the, the slides that I wanted to get through. So let's, let's take a look at some code and see what this is all like in practice. 
So what I'm going to do here is I have um, I have a little app that's running, and I'll show what the app looks like first. Um, it's a tip calculator app, which is obviously a very, very needed app in the world right now. There's just not enough tip calculators out there. Um, so I think this is getting really, really close to, to being able to submit to the store and um, make me millions of dollars. So it's written in Xamarin Forms, so it's you know one, one small code base to, to conquer all the, the platforms here. So I can enter a tip. You can see that um, it's using MVVM, and I notify property change, which definitely means it's on the verge of making millions. Um, and I can come in here. I can enter a tip percentage. And actually, it seems like there's a, a pretty embarrassing bug in here. Um, you'd almost think that I set this up for a testing talk. Uh, but let's see, let's see that what happens on Android if I do the same thing here. Um, OK, so we, we have the same exact bug on, on both platforms here. Uh, that's the, the non-marketing side of shared code base is you know, one bug on all platforms. But let's, let's take a look at what the, the code is like here and, and see what we can do. Um, from an app perspective, there's really not much um, going on in the app. So there's not, I'm not hiding any magic or doing anything special here. It's really just the UI is just a bunch of labels and entry fields that are bound to a view model. Uh, from the code behind, there really isn't a code behind. It's just this view model. And then if I take a look at the view model, there's not much here either. So we have a bunch of properties that we can bind to. And whenever the subtotal or the tip percentage are updated from the UI, then it automatically updates the tip and the total here. So that's all just happening through data binding. And that's, that's basically it. So before we try and dig into the bug, Let, let's try and set things up so we can write a failing test around this first, so that we know that this bug will never happen again um, once, we, we're, once we're done fixing it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come in, we're going to add a new portable class library here, call it tipper.tests. And then what I'm going to do is, first I'm going to add a reference to Tipper. So this is the portable class library that has all the Xamarin and form stuff. It has the view model. And because we chose uh, MVVM for the architecture here, all of the logic is in this, this nice view model class that's nice and testable. So there's, there's no other dependencies that need to be brought in. Um, and we can set things up as a, a split view here so we can look at kind of both sides at once. And what I'm going to do is call this tip view model tests. And let's go and add a test for this. So I'm going to say, and actually before I do that, we need to add a, a testing framework. And the framework that I want to show off today is called XUnit. So XUnit is a, a nice modern testing framework that has a really, really great cross-platform story. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add this XUnit to the project. And I'm also going to add one other package called XUnit Console Runner. So there's a bunch of runners that you can you can install for XUnit, and you can so if you're running it in Visual Studio or running it from the console, you you have a bunch of options at your disposal there. Um, and I, and I'll show what what that kind of buys you in in a few minutes. So first, let's add a test for this. So I'm going to say we'll give it a, a pretty bad test name, but that's how demos go. In, in XUnit, you decorate your, your tests with a, a fact attribute. And now we can write our tests. I'm going to create a view model. And we'll pull in the, the reference to the view models there. And we'll just set the properties the same way that the UI is going to set them through data binding. So I could set a subtotal to so 100. View model dot tip percentage is 10. And then we could just do some assertions here. So I'm going to say assert equal that the view model's tip amount should be $10. And we'll do one more that says the total should now be 110. And that's basically all we need to reproduce this scenario. So that's exactly what the UI was doing, but we don't need a UI to, to set these things, these things up. So First, let's try running this from the console, since um, that, that's kind of a, a nice way to smoke things out, and you get uh, Mono can run XUnit tests from the console. So I'm going to say packages. Uh, 
I think it's console.exe, and then we're going to say tipper.tests bin We can run this, and we'll see we got that failing test just like we expected here. So this is running on, on Mono, uh, which is you know obviously the equivalent of running it on .NET if you were in Visual Studio or something like that. But we have our failing test. But let's before we try and fix that, let's let's take this a little further and make this more interesting. So what I'm going to do is create an iOS app. So we could just create a new app. I'm going to call it Tipper.tests iOS. Um, we don't need to create this for multiple screen sizes, not that it makes that much of a difference. Uh, I can close this. And what I'm going to do is, we're gonna, first I'm going to add a reference to our test project. Since as I mentioned in the, in the slides, we're able to take those XUnit tests and run them on all these different platforms without any modification. So I can just reference that test project, and then I'm going to go back to NuGet and say X unit for devices. And somewhere in this list, you can see this X unit for devices NuGet package. So this will allow you to run those X unit tests on iOS, Android, Windows Phone, Windows 8. Um, basically, it's a Xamarin Forms test runner for X unit. And it makes it super, super easy to get started. So you can see it's adding the reference there, it's adding the, the NuGet package. And the last thing that it adds, you'll see that there's this appdelegate.cs.txt file added. All you need to do to get started really quickly is take the contents of this file, go back to your generated app delegate class, and just overwrite that. And that's going to give you everything it needs to start up the XUnit test runner when the app actually starts up. And then after that, the only thing that you need to do is tell the XUnit runner which assemblies you want to scan for XUnit tests. So I'm going to say tip view model tests. Pull in that reference. And that's it. So now, if I set this as the startup project, we'll run this on this iPhone 5S emulator here. You'll see we have a nice little test runner, similar to the one that I had a screenshot of earlier. And if I hit run, we get our failing test here as well, with the same exact failure condition. So now we're testing that this fails on multiple platforms. Just for the sake of completeness, we can go through and say, I'll add a new project. We'll do Android this time. So new Android app, tipper.tests droid. We'll say latest and greatest, because why not? Not that that um, impacts here. It's just for the, the test runner itself. Create the project, and we're going to follow the same flow that I took before. So add a reference to the test project, and then come in here and say X unit for devices. Add that. And just like when I did that on the iOS project, it added the appdelegate.cs.txt. You're going to see that here it adds a main activity.cs.txt. So we follow the same exact process as before. So I come in here, I overwrite all of that stuff with the contents of that text file, and then I'm just going to do the same thing to point XUnit at the assembly that we need. Tip view model tests assembly. We pull in that using statement. And then I'm going to come here. And we'll do a build. And set that as a startup project while it's building. And then once that's done building, we can run that in my emulator that I'm running here. And we'll be able to see that that test is actually failing on Android now as well. So now we have consistency and we can actually go and try and fix this bug. So if I jump back into my view model, odds are the, the problem is in this update tip method. And now if I take another look at this, we can see that, well, tip percentage is an integer here, but when you're doing multiplication like this, we need to treat this as, as a decimal and, and divide it by 100. So I'm going to come in, 
I can fix this bug, pretty embarrassing bug. I could do another build. And then if we rerun the tests, we should see that the, the test actually passes now. And since we have this test in place, we can know that we're never going to implement uh, or introduce that same bug ever again. So I could run this over on the Android side. And while we're waiting for that to deploy, I can rerun it here. So running it on mono has the test passing now. And running it on Android does as well. And if we ran it on iOS, we would see the same exact result, which is awesome. So we have the same test running everywhere. We know that everything is good to go. And now I can ship this to the store and, and make a whole bunch of money. So that's a basic look at the, the unit testing side of things. Um, I have a, a series of blog posts I've been doing on my blog for, for ways to lower unit testing friction. And I and anything you could do to lower the friction to adding tests is, is highly recommended because it's going to make you that much more likely to, to add new tests and maintain. Um, so doing things like code snippets. So I can go and I could do fact tab tab here and quickly have the scaffolding for um, for a new test and things like like having shortcuts to run your tests or run the console or in your IDE to run your tests anything you can do there is is going to make it miles better um, and so much more likely for you to to keep up and maintain these tests and have them be a useful tool for you so with the unit tests out of the way let's take a look at trying to do that exact same test but from a UI test perspective so I'm going to go into the project, uh, the UI test project here that was generated for me by, uh, by Xamarin when I added the project originally. So this is nothing special going on here. And what I'm going to do is now we're in end unit because um, currently test cloud only supports uh, end unit. Um, there's a user voice entry for X unit support. So if, if any of you that are listening want to be my best friend, go vote for that. Uh, <laughs> Go vote for that user voice and let's try to get X unit support because it's awesome. But it's not so bad to use N unit either. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a test here and say calculates tip correctly again. And you can see here that there's this app object that implements this iApp interface. And if you, I mentioned earlier that you can write all your tests in a way that's very cross-platform friendly. And if you're writing them against this, anything it, exposed from this IAP interface, your tests, those are going to be methods that are supported across both platforms. So if I do app dot, you're going to see all sorts of really awesome methods here for doing most of the things that you want to do on the app. So you can query, you can enter text into a text field, you can press enter, volume up, down, rotate um, to portrait or, or landscape mode, all that sort of stuff. The place I recommend starting is this REPL command. So what that's going to give you, and I'll pull up the unit test sidebar here so you could also see that you get kind of a nice breakdown of all your different tests that you might want to run. Um, and you can pick which platform you want to run it on, and you can pick which device you want to run it on. Um, for right now, let's say, let's run this, this test that I just created on, in the iOS simulator. So what that's going to do is, for each run on an iOS simulator, it's going to shut down whatever's running and give you a, a fresh simulator instance to run. It's going to start up the app. And now that the test is running, it's going to hit this app.repl call, and it's going to pop open this terminal window here. And I'll bump up the size a little bit. And you can see that in this terminal window, you have access to this exact same app object that you have access to in your tests. So you can start figuring out everything that you need to do from a REPL standpoint before you take it into your actual tests. The best place to start when you first pop open the, the REPL window is this command called tree. So if you type tree, you'll see that you get a nice representation of the whole visual tree here, and you can see what things you might be available to target different elements in the UI. So in this case, I could say something like app.entertext, we go up here, we see we're looking for the subtotal text field. So I'm going to take that text. Let's enter 100 into that. Well, that was easy enough. So let's go and do the same thing for tip percentage. So 
So now we've recreated the same scenario that we were doing in our view model unit tests. So now let's try and pull out the, the tip and the total there. So one of those is tip amount. You can see we can do query, and query is going to give us uh, basically just an array of any element that matches the query that we gave it. In this case, it's really just this one. And we can do the same for total just to make sure that we can pull that out of the UI. And we can. We can see that it has the text that we were expecting here. So now, now we want to go add that to our tests. So I'm going to come back and I'm going to say copy. And it, that actually copies any successful command that you had into your clipboard. So if I exit this, come back into my IDE and say, and paste it, you can see I have basically the whole test written for me here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, I'm going to pull the text out of this. As I mentioned before, the, the query the query method returns a, a list of results. We know that we're expecting one, so I could pull the text out of that. And then we could do the same for total. That text. And we can just do assertions based on that. So we could say that the tip, and we can create one for the total. And now, if I go and I run this test again, it shouldn't pop the REPL because we took away that app.REPL call, but now it's actually going to run those assertions and make sure that the UI is properly reflecting this, the, expect, the expected results of what we were trying to do there. If I pull this up. See it's going through, so it's running the, the first enter text. Now it's running the second one, and if you watch right here, you'll see that that just turned into a, a green checkbox. So the test passed, the assertions all passed, and I can actually just go and run this on Android now, and we can see that it, it'll run and work there as well. So it's going to shut down the app, clear out all of your data, run the app in a fresh instance, and now we have this passing on Android as well. So one other pattern that I want to show off here is, like, this is great, and you can imagine writing this similar test over and over in different scenarios or having to repeat these selectors multiple times. So one pattern that can be really nice is the, the screen object pattern. So basically what that means is you'll define an object that represents a single screen in your app, and that is where you can contain any logic that needs to know how to select things out of the UI. And it's super, super easy to do and, and makes your tests a lot more readable and maintainable. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say we're going to pass in an instance of an IAP. We're going to pass in an IAP into, into this class. So IAP. And then we can just define nice methods, and they could be strongly typed methods for interacting with the screen. So if I said, we'll create a, a public void method called enter subtotal, we can give it a, it can take in a decimal, so there's no magic strings or anything going on here. And then we can just take what we had up here and move it into this method. So the, it's this class that's taking care of anything that needs to know about interacting with the UI and exposing a really nice API, API for it. So we could do the same for tip percent, and this will take in an integer. Just copy this method down. And then what we can actually do here is I'll just pull these out. And using nice new C sharp syntax, I could just say public string. So now all we have to do for this test, I'm going to say equals new screen, give it the app, screen dot set the subtotal to 100. Set the tip to 
we can get rid of the rest of this and then just say screen tip text and Xamarin Studio is going to say that that's not accurate but it's a liar so now I could build that and if we run this test again it should still pass and now we can we can easily write new tests um, that all take advantage of these different elements on the screen without having to spread knowledge of how to query the UI into all different parts of our tests and our apps. So that, and it, on top of that, just an added bonus is that your test ends up reading a whole lot better. And you could turn this into something like a fluent interface or whatever kind of works for the test that you're writing. Um, but it's a lot easier to reason about the scenario that you're testing when you have this nice strongly typed API for your screens. And you could start using these screen objects in different tests and different classes and, and whatever um, ends up making sense. So now we have a nice shared test code base. The, the last step here is that we want to take these and we want to run them up in test cloud. So we want to run them across a whole host of devices that we don't have to have locally. The first thing that you can do is there's one method that I didn't show yet called app.screenshot. And it's exactly what it sounds like. So you can create basically little checkpoints in your, in your test runs um, and that'll be reflected when you load up the uh, test cloud run. And personally, when I do this, I tend to define them in, in sort of a behavior-driven development kind of style because that, that makes for very readable tests as you're looking at different stages of a test run. So I would say something like when I run the app, and we'll grab a shot of what it looks like when the app first starts, I can add one more that says, and I enter a subtotal of $100. We could do one more that says, and I tip 10%. So each time we're doing something in the UI, we're capturing exactly what the UI looks like at that point. So we could we could step through it later and see, see what happened. And then here I would say I get a total of, and that's it. And just as kind of a cool little side tangent here, if you look at the return type of app.screenshot, it's actually returning a file info object. So if, if you were running these things locally, you could actually just start capturing screenshots locally. Um, and one of the things that I use this for uh, that isn't related to testing is I've I use this for generating screenshots of my apps automatically so that I could run them in all the different simulators and emulators that I need to without having to run the whole suite of things I need captured for every app release uh, by hand, because that's very, very tedious. So you can actually start using these for all sorts of different things, which is fun. But, so now if we want to run this um, in Test Cloud, you have to use release builds. And then it's as simple as saying, run in Test Cloud here. And you could pick whether you want to run your iOS or your Android one. You click Upload and Run, and that's going to upload it to Test Cloud and then prompt you for, for the devices that you want to run your tests on. In the interest of time, I already have that set up. But you would see something like this when you first load up your screen, or you first load up your app. So if this was an Android run, you would see this list of Android devices. You can see that there's a lot, which is awesome. Um, there's a lot of devices from a lot of manufacturers across a lot of different versions of Android. So you could really start pinpointing the things that you want to test. Um, and you get nice little filters here too. So, like for example, recently we, were, we found that we had some issues on Android 4.0, so I was able to really quickly hone in on those devices and run tests against those without having to run them against everything. So depending on what you're looking to test, it's really easy to just pinpoint what you want to do and then target it. Um, and you have enough variety to make sure that you're really covering um, what's out there. So let's take a look at what this looks like from a, uh, a run standpoint. So this is, this is basically the same, the same tests run against the same app against 10 different iOS devices. On the overview, you can see that you'll get a list of the total device time that you spent running these tests, the peak memory usage, app size. You'll see uh, how many failures you had by category or form factor, manufacturer, and that sort of thing. And then if you dig into here, these are what I was mentioning before about the strings that you, you send in for the app.screenshot call. 
So those are going to get captured here, and you get a nice timeline of the whole flow through your app at the stages you care about. So if I jump into this iPhone 6, as I step through here, you can see the progression of the UI uh, before and after the, the tip was entered here. Um, you get access to the console log, so if you, if you need to see what was printed there, that you'll have access to that. You have access to memory usage across these different, uh, and CPU usage as well, across these different steps. So if you had a particular action in your app that caused a big memory spike or a big CPU spike, it gets really easy to pinpoint where that happened because you had snapshots of all these different metrics at each of these points at which you called app.screenshot. Um, but you get your device logs, you get your, your full-size screenshot here, you get basically all the information that you need. And then you can see the exact same stuff over on the Android side. So this was 10 Android devices across a variety of versions, and um, I guess these were all Samsung devices. But you see the same sort of thing. So you can, you can jump into here and see what the what it was like to run this app across uh, on the Galaxy S4 running Android 4.4.2, um, the S4 running Android 4.3, and all these different steps. So you can really start to see what your app looks like and behaves like on all these different platforms. And you can also see, sorry, you can also see trends of what it was like from run to run. So you could see that, uh, oh, well, in, in this run, three of the tests started failing, and you could start to compare things back and forth that way. Um, and you can also start hooking these things up into your CI environments, too, because you, you can do test cloud runs from the command line as well. So you can have, say, if you're using Team City, you can have Team City kick off a test, test cloud build, um, and then it can actually have those reported back as end unit tests so that your Team City build even displays all the results of all these different devices and test scenarios for you. So you have them all in your one unified place, which is really powerful as well. Um, but that's that's kind of the gist of, of running things in Test Cloud. Um, and I just wanted to make sure I left a, a little bit of time here, since I haven't been interrupted yet, um, just in case there were, were any questions. Yeah, Greg, there was one uh, Mitch had earlier that I wanted to leave to the end. Um, so assuming you're not using Test Cloud, if you could only pick just a few limited devices, how do you choose which devices to buy? How would you do that uh, for their local device testing? Um, I would really just target that based on market share. Um, and market share with the caveat of like where your users are, what kind of users you have. Um, a really, I mentioned earlier the importance of things like analytics. So if you had analytics, something like Google or Xamarin Insights or, or what have you in your app that could tell you what devices your users had, that's the best way to go about figuring out what you should be testing. So if you see that you know, 60% of your, your user base is on, say, the Galaxy S5 or something, then you should probably, regardless of whether you have access to Test Cloud, you should probably have an S5 on hand just to make sure that those users are happy. Um, but but the, the best recommendation I could give is just to to do it based on real metrics, either of what your users are doing, or if you don't have that data yet, then look at some market share st statistics of the locations of where your users are and then make some decisions based on that. On top of that, it's also the Nexus devices are also very, very, well, for one, they tend to be pretty popular, which is nice, um, but they're also really great to have on hand because they are um, vanilla Android versions too, so they, they can be very good uh, starting points for, for local testing. And a new one will be announced in about 10 minutes, probably. Um, yeah. <laughs> so another thing, though, um, even if you can't buy all the devices, this is where something like Test Flight or Hockey App would come in as well. Try to recruit people who own those devices to do your beta testing for you. So you don't have to own every single one, but try to find people who do have it and have them at least do some testing on it uh, as well. Precisely. Yeah, great point. Uh, Brady said, is the source code for this example available somewhere to try out locally? Uh, so if you have a source code for us, Greg, we can include a link on the, the Xamarin University website when we put up the materials and the, the video. So that would be a, a good place to look for that as well. So I'll get that. Yeah, from you. I'll absolutely. I'll, I'll definitely provide all the materials that I had here. Okay. Yeah, I'll get that from you. And so, uh, as always, check out the university website. The video will probably be up a little bit later today as we go through there. 
Does anybody else have any other questions? All right, so if you do have questions, now's the time to get them in before we uh, finish up. But I just want to say uh, thank you so much, Greg. As always, that's a fantastic presentation. I always learn uh, so much when I uh, hear you talk or read your, read your stuff. So I definitely suggest everyone follow Greg's blog. You'll learn a ton of things. So remember, I appreciate it. It's, it's an honor to honor to come on. Uh, it was awesome. Thanks for everyone who tuned in. Um, you know, if you have questions that come up later, I just wanted to make sure I pulled up my contact information again. I'm I'm always available to to answer questions either through email or Twitter or or what have you. So if you have any questions and and I can be of help, definitely reach out. Yeah, and uh, John does have a question. How would you test for mobile phone calls coming in while you're on a screen? So interruptions. Ah, I figures the the last one is a tough one. Um, <laughs> I actually I don't have I don't know of any way to automate that that well. I mean I guess you could I mean you could use something like Twilio I guess to automate a call to a phone that you're running a test on that would probably get kind of tough to orchestrate. Um, so that that stuff gets into the territory of things that I think manual tests are good for because then you have someone who can coordinate all these different moving parts. Um, for you and make sure that things are still working correctly. So to me, I think that falls into the, that category of, you know, if it's really hard to automate, then it's not, manual testing is still a very, very valid thing. Um, and then you're still making sure that you're, you're spending those manual testing cycles on things that are hard to automate. So I, I would probably at least start with that approach. Yeah, because things like uh, UI test and Calabash, they're only going to be able to interact with your app. They're not going to be in our able to interact with the rest of the phone or the rest of the device. So you can't uh, have a phone call come in and you can't press the home button, for example. And if your app gets backgrounded, you don't have a way to bring it back because you can't uh, do that. So that definitely, like you said, I think would probably be a manual test uh, for that situation. All right, great. Any, any other questions? Again, let us know. Otherwise, like Greg said, you can contact uh, myself, or you can contact him with any questions. And uh, remember, everyone, like I said, these guest lectures are recorded. This will be up a little bit later today. They're uh, available exclusively for you, Xamarin University students. And we'll have a link up there to all the materials that Greg has for us. And our next lecture is going to be next Tuesday at 8 a.m. Pacific, same time, or 3 p.m. GMT. And that's going to be Adam J. Wolf who is going to help us with what I know is the hardest part of app development, for myself at least, which is our UI design. Adam's going to show us how we can break out of the box and create some beautiful apps using Xamarin Forms. So thank you to everyone for attending. Thank you once again to Greg, and we'll see you all in class. Have a great day.